right, we got a lot of material this morning to go through, so I just want to jump right into it. As you all know, this class has been all about responding to the skeptic, defending our faith in a world that is full of skeptics. And we've talked about a lot of different stuff. We've talked about how logic and reason lead an objective observer to the reasonable conclusion that there is one transcendent personal creator who caused everything in the universe and that he can intervene in our world. We've talked about the different, some of the different religions in the world. Oh, sorry, my old man. We've talked about some of the different religions in the world that hold a monotheistic view or a view that is consistent with that and how the major difference in those is in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we have been exploring Jesus Christ, what we know about Him. Four classes ago, we talked about how reliable historic sources from outside of the Bible attested to the historicity of Jesus Christ, of His existence, and the basic facts of His life that correspond to the Bible. And since then, we've shown that as Christians, that our belief that the Bible presents us with a reliable account of Jesus and the times that He lived in is a reasonable belief and it is reasonable because, for example, compared with other historic literature, we got an enormous amount of copies of the Bible from different places and different geographic areas, all of which give us a great confidence that what we read today about Jesus is what was originally written and that it has not been altered and changed in any material way over time. We also have confidence that uh, these Gospels, that the New Testament, that it was written in the same form we see them today, that they was also written very, very closely in time to the actual events which it records, which also gives us greater confidence that it didn't develop later on, that it was written contemporaneously almost from a historical perspective with the events that transcribed. And also, we can see from non-Christian authors and historians it corroborates the basic history of Jesus and what we know about Him, that the corroborating evidence from the rocks and stones and the things that we dig up out of the dirt, the archaeological finds, that they also demonstrate the credibility and the trustworthiness of what we read in the Gospel accounts. We also see that the New Testament books, the Gospels, were viewed by as authoritative by the early church, which elevated them and pruned away other books and writings which came along later, which did not meet those same attributes, giving us great confidence in the very Bible that we have. So armed with all that then, what did those Gospels tell us about Jesus? The very thing upon which our entire faith rests. They tell us that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross and that He was resurrected for the remission of sins, resurrected to life. This is a principle that the Apostle Paul calls the central tenet of our faith. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in 17, a verse that we are familiar with. The Apostle Paul writes, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hoped in Christ, we are of all pity, uh, all people the most to be pitied. Now this is the Apostle Paul essentially saying, hey, the central tenet of the Christian faith, what it's all about, what it all hinges on, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so let's turn to that. Let's turn to Jesus Christ's resurrection. Now, and let's look at things that the skeptic, how the skeptic might approach this and how we might respond to some of those things. Now, we have already demonstrated from some of these prior classes about the reliability and the trustworthiness of the accounts in the Bible. And so if you're going to do this, of course, you've got to start with saying, well, this, this, this is what the Bible says, and we've talked about how reliable the Bible is and why it's trustworthy. But to the skeptic, the assertion, even from a document that has been demonstrated to be historically reliable and to be credible, for a skeptic to still say, well, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, still invites criticism by the skeptic who still has a hard time with that. And the skeptic may say, well, well, the Bible, you know, the Bible alone, that, that is an outstanding, incredible fact that is out of the ordinary, and I need more from that. So let's delve into it, and let's see what more we can find. Uh, many of y'all, you know, we've referenced it several times in this class, that Lee Strobel book, The Case for Christ, which is a, which is a great book. And a lot of the material here, I'm, 
pulling from is pulled from that. It's also pulled from interviews with a fellow named God, uh, Dr. Gary Habermas, uh, Dr. Michael Lacona. Uh, there's a lot of scholarship on this subject, and I've tried to pull from all of that. But let's begin by just looking to some basic facts that are generally agreed upon by most scholars, both skeptics and Christians, in looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what we can, can learn about that and investigate the Bible's claims as to the resurrection. Fact number one, Jesus was killed by the crucifixion. Now, again, we've previously talked about how the Gospels have been shown to present us with reliable information, that they got the history right, that they got the people right. It was accurately passed down to us. All four Gospels report that Jesus was crucified and that this resulted in His death. We also see this from all the early Christian writers and letters that we have that aren't in the Bible themselves. The early Christian leaders who make references back to it. But again, we'll go, we need to go beyond that in terms of responding to the skeptics. So when we do, we quickly encounter corroboration by non-Christian sources which were openly hostile to Christianity, which were against Christianity. And, and I think we can all agree that the hostile witnesses and their source and what they say, if they say anything good about you is generally true because they wouldn't have a, a motivation to say it about you if it wasn't because they're kind of against you. That's a hostile witness. That's somebody that really doesn't want to help you, hostile to your cause. So if they say something that is generally in support, then it can be also it corroborated your account and it's generally considered to be reliable. We talked about a few of these in prior classes but they're even more relevant here. Cornelius Tacitus, one of the greatest historians of ancient Rome, wrote in his book, The Annals, which was a history of a portion of Roman history. He was talking about a great fire that broke out in Rome and how the emperor Nero, how he tried to, was being blamed for it, that there was a rumor going around that the emperor Nero had started the fire in order to raise a bunch of Rome in order to create a grand building project. And so he tried to shift the blame to the new Christian church in Rome. And so the Roman historian wrote this, Hence to suppress the rumor that he'd started the fire, the emperor falsely charged with the guilt and punished Christians who were hated for their enormities. This next sentence is very important in the context of what we're looking at today. Christus, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius, but the pernicious superstition was pressed for a time, broke out again, not only through Judea where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Clearly a man that is not a friend, right, of Christianity. And yet this great Roman historian who we take so much from and adapted into our historical understanding of Rome states here, that Christ was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. Now, we have additional attestation from sources outside the Bible, historical sources. The Jewish historian Josephus, who we also talked about a few classes ago, who in his, in his work wrote in his Jewish antiquities not many years after, after the times of Jesus. Now, Josephus, he was a contemporary of the same period knew a lot of these same people from his own personal experience and how he wrote how Pilate had condemned Jesus to be crucified. We also have additional information like this and we've gone through some of these a few classes ago so I'm not going to go through them all but Lucian the satirist who writing not a hundred years after Christ wrote mentions the crucifixion and how the Jewish Talmud the historical works of the Jewish people, how it even reports that Jesus was killed. So that the fact that Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross is demonstrated and was killed is demonstrated to us convincingly not only from the Bible, from Scripture, and from the letters and writings of the early church, but also from contemporary historians which attest to that fact. So in light of that, Dr. Michael Zona, in a Lee Strobel interview in the case of Christ, says Jesus was crucified and died as a result. The scholarly consensus, again, even amongst those who are skeptical towards the resolution, is basically 
overwhelming. Now, even in the face of this, there are, there are some skeptics over time who have had a different theories, uh, and I bring this one up because it is in line, it, it kind of goes along with this part of the topic, and there is this theory that Jesus never died on the cross, and it can be found in the Quran, uh, which was written in the 7th century. Some Muslims claim that Jesus escaped the cross and fled to India, and there's actually a shrine there that is supposedly marking his burial place. And some skeptics have offered that view as well, claim that Jesus uh, fainted from exhaustion on the cross and only appeared to die and was later revived in the cool air of the tomb. Uh, conspiracy theorists point to uh, Pilate, you know, being surprised at how quickly Jesus had succumbed, which is a reference in, in Mark chapter 15, and that Jesus was given some kind of a liquid on the cross that was also in Mark chapter 15. But these, these not only contradict these other sources, it also is a misunderstanding of what a Roman crucifixion actually involved. Remember, Jesus was flogged before he was crucified. A terrible Roman beating which shreds the flesh. Archaeology and history teaches us that Roman floggings were not, not just beatings in the sense of someone getting a few fists. They, they resulted in terrible, terrible wounds that sometimes resulted in deaths in themselves from lashes upon the back with cruel instruments. The Gospels describe how Jesus was so weary and thirsty as, as, he, as he got around to the point where he had to carry the cross, which is uh, consistent with the effects of hypovolemic shock from the loss of blood, which would have been a part of the flogging. And then, of course, Jesus was crucified. But what we know about crucifixions now is what we've discovered from archaeology, in addition to ancient writings, which shows us crucifixion victims. In 1968, Jerusalem archaeologists found the remains of about three dozen Jews that had been crucified after their uprising against Rome in 70 A.D., which would be only about 40 or so years after Jesus' crucifixion. And confirmed that in a Roman crucifixion, spikes are driven through both the wrists and the feet. What this, this is here is a heel bone. And you can see the spike which has entered in one side of it and has come out of the other. This was from this archaeological dig. So you've got their spikes driven through the wrist and feet which causes excruciating pain. Uh, a word that literally means out of the cross because they, they had to come up with a new word to describe this pain. And, and actually ex excruciating comes from that, out of the cross. Put vertical arms pulled out of socket, the crucifixion victim dies from asphyxiation um, as the victim who is stretched into an inhaling position has to struggle to exhale by pushing himself up onto the cross itself. And once the victim is completely exhausted and unable to do this anymore, the victim is unable to breathe and dies. Of course, the Bible also tells us that a uh, Roman soldier pierces Jesus' side to confirm death, and then, which resulted in water and blood exiting the wound, which would be consistent with what is called a uh, pericardial effusion, a collection of fluid around the heart and lungs, which has been caused from heart failure. In light of this, it is incredibly difficult for anyone who understands what a Roman crucifixion was to take the position that Jesus somehow survived on the cross, which is all why all but the most marginalized of academic views acknowledge that Jesus was crucified and died on the cross. Dr. William Edwards in a 1986 article in the journal American Medical Association said this, he said, clearly the weight of the historical medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound of his side was inflicted accordingly interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. And of course they are with odds with the Bible as well as the sources from outside of the Bible which all attest to the fact that Jesus died on the cross. Not as a theological fact, but as a historical fact. 
So we turn to the next one. Number two, Jesus' tomb was empty. Jesus' tomb was empty. Now again, this is something in the Bible shows us the Bible, which we've talked about being a reliable document. We've talked about all the reasons why, about how the archaeological finds are all consistent with it. The people and places that are named within it are consistent. And the Bible tells us the tomb was empty. But let's go again. Let's go beyond that. Um, Dr. Gav Gary Habermas, who is a professor who plays a major role in Lee Strobel's Case for Christ, if you've seen that, claims to have surveyed skeptic and non-skeptic scholars alike and concludes that there is very strong objective consensus by skeptics and non-skeptic scholars that Jesus' tomb was empty because it is very strongly supported by Christian and non-Christian sources. Now, Dr. Habermas basically takes three strands of evidence which he uses to support this point. The first one is what he calls the Jerusalem factor. Now, Jesus' death was a very public death in Jerusalem. And likewise, shortly thereafter, his disciples' claims that he had been resurrected were also very public as well. And they were both made public in the exact same place, in the exact same location. And only within a matter of days of one another. So it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist, right, to realize that it would have been impossible for Christianity to have gotten off the ground if Jesus' body had remained in the tomb. Because the Jews or the Romans could simply have produced the corpse and said, hey, look, here's the body. You're lying. There's nothing to this Christianity resurrection theory. Here's the corpse. The church, though, was founded on the resurrection. Disproving it would have destroyed the Christian movement, especially in its early stages. But instead of seeing that kind of disproof throughout the first century, what we do see is that Christians were threatened, they were beaten, they were flogged, they were ridiculed. But it would have been much simpler to have silenced them by just producing a corpse. But this was never done. Instead, what do we see? We see enemy attestation, and that's the second point that Dr. Havilland makes or in other words, support for the tomb being empty coming again from others outside of Christianity, from the enemies of Christianity. And you know, this is one that we actually see in the Bible itself, too. And again, we've already shown there's good reason to that it contains reliable accounts in Matthew chapter 28, verse 11 through 15. And y'all will remember this. The Jewish high priest told the tomb guards, right, to, to say that the disciples came and stole away the body in the night where everybody else was uh, sleeping. A rumor that Matthew writes still persists amongst the Jews. Why, make, why say that if the tomb was occupied? We also find this in Jewish anti-Christian works. Uh, a work called the, uh, the uh, Toledoth Yeshu and then later a Justin Martyr work from a little bit later on in the second century as well, which claims that Jesus' disciples stole the body. The Jews would have had every interest in preserving any account that Jesus' grave had remained untouched. But instead, they shared the conviction with their Christian contemporaries that the grave was empty. And we also see, and this is, is number three, uh, we see the attestation by the Gospels, by Christianity, that women were the first discoverers of the empty tomb. Now, why, why is this why is this important? Well, and, and you know, there was y'all heard a message on this from Adam not too many weeks ago. If this was a made-up story, then why in the world would the disciples point to the testimony of women that the tomb is empty? Now, today in contemporary society, of course, women and men's testimony in court is treat, treat, treated on a completely equal basis, as it should be. But in first century Roman and Jewish cultures, women were lowly esteemed and their testimony was considered to be highly questionable. So if I want to concoct a story in that time and in that culture to come up with something that didn't happen, then the last thing that I would do is say, well, I would have these women discovering the empty tomb. Because right out of the gate, it would hurt my credibility, my story's credibility. Right off the gate, you'd be telling this and they'd go, whoa, 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 wait a minute now. 
You say women disability in D10? Well, you know, that's you know, we're not going to take that. But yet that is the story. So why would that be done? Well, the, the, the best reason why gospel writers would include that embarrassing detail, because it would have been in that time, would be because that's what actually happened. And they wanted to get it right. And so they included that detail regardless of the credibility issue that it presented for them. Now based on these things, it's, it's easy to see why then there is this strong consensus that the tomb was empty. All right, next fact. Next fact, Jesus' disciples authentically, truly believed that he rose and appeared to them and they died for that belief. When Jesus was crucified, their movement lost its leader in the most humiliating way possible during that time and era. Leaving them discouraged, leaving them depressed. They didn't have confidence any longer that Jesus had been sent by God. Jews believed that anybody who was crucified had been cursed by God. They had been taught that God would not allow the Messiah to suffer death. So they were dejected, dispersed. But then we see just a real short time after that, we see them abandoning their jobs, regathering together, committing themselves to spreading the message that Jesus Christ was the Messiah who died on the cross, but who returned to life and was seen alive by them. Now what happened? Multiple very early eyewitness testimony to the disciples' claims that they had seen the risen Jesus. Now, very early Christian creeds that Christians have the belief that these folks had witnessed firsthand the resurrection exist contradicting skeptics who would claim that, well, this belief only occurred later on. You know, it was only after a period of years and it developed as kind of like a legend, right? No, what we see is it happened right away. We see Paul writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 8, what is considered a record of the earliest Christian oral creed in the Bible. In that letter, when he writes, and we've talked about the, the, how the, we talked in an earlier class about how the language here that is used is consistent with passing on an oral tradition that Paul says he himself learned from Christians at his conversion. And we've been able to kind of piece together the dates on where that must have been. So at the crucifixion, was as early as 30 A.D. And we know from Acts that Paul's conversion would have been soon after, in about 32 A.D., that Paul would have received this oral tradition at some point between then and his writings in the early 40s A.D., suggesting an oral creed that Paul that would have been formulated and used by the very early church right out of the gate. And what does it say? For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and then He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. And then, of course, likewise, we know that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all demonstrate all that we have talked about why they are reliable in the different accounts, how... They have not been altered through history throughout the years, contain multiple accounts of the resurrection, certainly establishing the resurrection as the central tenet of the Christian faith. And that early creed, as well as the Gospels, names specific persons and groups that saw Jesus. It mentions Peter and the twelve disciples, the names of the people who saw Him, and were written at a time when people could still talk to Him when people could still go and see them and talk to them and investigate and find out for themselves. Okay, so here's what we got. We got these very early accounts pointing directly to specific people who say that they are eyewitnesses to this thing that happened. And people who are still around at the time that these things are being written, which of course basically ask people to check it out for themselves. And to stamp it out if they can disprove it. But in the face of that, this thing keeps growing and growing and growing. This is an important point. This, this stuff, this material didn't come along after everybody that was around that would have seen it was dead. This stuff came along while they were still alive. As a, a professor at the University of London, a guy named Ambrose Fleming, 
he wrote this. He said, we got to take the evidence of experts as to the age and authenticity of this writing, just like we take the, the facts of astronomy or something else on the evidence of astronomers who don't contradict each other. We can ask ourselves whether it is probable that such a book describing events that occurred about 30 or 40 years previously could have been accepted, whether it could have been cherished if the stories of abnormal events in it were false or mythical. It is impossible because the memory of all elderly persons regarding the events of 30 or 40 years before is perfectly clear. And he writes this. Now, he wrote this in the early 20th century, and Queen Victoria had only died 30 or 40 years before him. He says, no, no one could now issue a biography of Queen Victoria who died 31 years ago full of anecdotes that were just not true. They would be contradicted at once. They would certainly not be generally accepted and passed on as being true. Hence, there is a great improbability that the account of the resurrection given in the Gospels is a pure invention. This myth mythical theory has had to be abandoned because it will not bear close scrutiny. So you take that and you look at Athens, Alabama, and you say, okay, well, let's do something comparable. Let's take a, let's take a city leader, uh, Robert Allen Tennant, who was my principal at Clements High School. Many of y'all know Mr. Tennant. Mr. Tennant was the mayor of the city of Athens for a while. Let's just say that somebody came out with a biography about him, Earl, that started saying all these kinds of things that he did and didn't do. Let's say that they said that he loved to spend city money. Let's say that he spent he spent city money on great public works and buildings throughout the town and millions of dollars were spent by Mayor Robert Allen Tennant. Well, y'all laugh because y'all know Robert Allen Tennant would spend a dime if he did not have to, right? He would not do it. We know him and love him and he was very tight with city funds. That kind of an account would be just laughed out of town. Nobody's going to accept that because we all know. Well, that's what happened with the Gospels, okay? These books, these writings, these stories were going around in the very same town where Jesus had been crucified. In the very same town where they said that he'd been resurrected. Could they have made it and survived if there was not truth in those stories? <laughs> well, they couldn't have made it any more than that story about Robert Allen Tennant. Could have made it. Now, another thing that we've got to take into account here is that we see the disciples believed this to the core of their being. They were willing to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming it. Without any payoff from a material point of view, it was a life of hardship, of reproach by their Jewish neighbors, the folks they had grown up with, their friends, we see them going without food. We see them being ridiculed. We see them being beaten. We see them in prison. We see them being killed, many through horrible torture. They willingly died and suffered in defense of this belief. Now, the Bible does not tell us how the apostles, except for James, died. So in looking at this, we got to look to the secular history, look to the church history, and many of those sources agree with the manner in which these apostles died. Now, not in all cases, and in some cases there are differing accounts that some died this way and some died that way. There are competing traditions regarding the time and place in some cases, but there are no competing traditions of them dying happy, natural deaths, except in the case of John, who folks have dying at an old age, exiled the Patmos and James the son of Alphaeus who has competing stories about him. James the brother of John. According to many accounts and of course according to Acts chapter 12 verse 2 he was beheaded in Jerusalem by Herod in about 44 AD. Philip was reported to be martyred in a very cruel way, crucified or beheaded in Hierapolis, Greece around 54 AD. They discovered Philip's tomb about six years ago in Greece. Andrew preached in Asia Minor in Greece. Most historians agree that he was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece in about 60 A.D. Matthew, tax collector, right, gospel writer, ministered, they say, in Persia and Ethiopia. Some of the oldest reports said that he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia in 60 A.D. for spreading the gospel. Peter, the knowledge of Peter's death is pretty widespread amongst both church and sources. They have him being crucified upside down in Rome in 64 A.D. during the persecution of Emperor Nero that I mentioned before. 
Thomas, the ancient uh, uh, Christians in India revere Thomas as their traditional uh, founder. Their tradition tells that he was executed with spears in India around 70 AD. Bartholomew, early Christian tradition, attributes that he had widespread travels throughout India, Armenia, Ethiopia, and he's said to have been flayed alive in Armenia, although there are some different accounts there. Matthias, the apostle chosen uh, to replace Judas. Some say he was killed by the sword. Some say he was stoned and beheaded in Jerusalem. Others say by burning. Thaddeus crucified in Odessa, Greece. Simon tradition has him martyred and killed in Persia. Others have him killed, crucified elsewhere. For all for their faith. Now, why did they do that? Why did they do it? It was because they were convinced beyond any doubt. Because they knew they had seen Jesus Christ alive from the dead. Now, sure, skeptic says, oh, shame. People die all the time for their beliefs, right? Japanese kamikazes in World War II willingly died because they believed their emperor willed it so and they would have rewards in the afterlife. We see uh, Islam jihadists blowing themselves up in the Middle East all the time because they believe that they're fighting a holy war and that they have rewards in heaven. Why are you saying this is different? Well, I'm saying it different. I'm saying this is different. Because in those examples, we've got people dying for their beliefs about Allah revealing himself to Muhammad and a Japanese emperor with rewards awaiting. But the men who had these beliefs had no direct observable evidence of that belief. They had not, in fact, seen that for themselves. They may very sincerely believe it to be true. They may very sincerely believe it so much that they were willing to die for it, but they cannot know it for a fact because they did not themselves see it. They didn't eyewitness it. They could be wrong. But the apostles, in contrast, were all willing to die for something that they had seen with their own eyes and touched with their own hands. They were in a unique position, not just to believe that Jesus was resurrected through faith based on what they heard from somewhere else, but to know with absolute certainty and they claim that they had done it and seen it and touched it and felt it themselves. People will die for their religious beliefs if they sincerely believe them to be true. But will people die for their religious beliefs if they know that they're false? That they have just been made up? That they made them up? Most folks can only have faith that their beliefs are true, but these guys want a position, a unique position, to actually know for a fact that Jesus Christ had rose from the dead. And if they weren't absolutely certain of this, then why would all of them allow themselves to be tortured to death in proclaiming the news of the resurrection? Or, or consider it another way. All right? Consider it like this. To say otherwise is to accuse the disciples, Peter and the rest, of deliberate fraud. <laughs> you know, if you say otherwise, then basically what we're saying is that Peter and the disciples completely made this up and planted a false belief to, in, in a resurrected Christ. But if you're planning a plot like that, You're willing to die for that? And if you're willing to find a plot like that, you know, a lot of people poke at the resurrection stories because in the different Gospels, they don't all read exactly the same way. You know, they read a little bit differently in different ways. If that was the case, then why don't we find a more consistent story across the bat? If they were making something up here, instead, what we find are stories about who saw him and when being a little bit different in the different Gospels. Now, if I'm making up a story, and I see this as a lawyer all the time, if you're making up your own story, concerted fraud, you make sure your stories are all exactly the same. Right? That they're all consistent and it reads that way. As uh, a guy named Professor Bloomberg, who we quoted in an earlier lesson, he wrote, there's enough of a discrepancy in the reports of the resurrection that we find in the Bibles to show that there could have been no previous concert amongst them. And that at the same time, such substantial agreement as to show that they were all independent narrators, narrators of the same great transaction. And again, these guys gave their very lives for that belief. Why would they do that for something that they knew was a fraud? To be tortured hideously and die for that? I don't think so. How could you not think that something incredibly remarkable clearly happened here to inspire that kind of audacious action? Now, in addition to these three things, I mean, we're, we're keeping these, 
facts, let's look at some corroborating evidence, okay? The first are some circumstantial evidence. And here's the first one we'll talk about. And this one comes from a guy named J.P. Moreland, who's talked about this a lot. You know, he, he points out that at, at the time of Jesus, the Jews had been persecuted, y'all, for 700 years. The Jews had been persecuted by the Babylonians, by the Assyrians, by the Persians, by the Greeks, and now by the Romans. And many Jews had been scattered abroad, right? And they lived as captives all over the ancient world. But we still see Jews today, right? Sure we do. We all know them too. But where are the Hittites? Where are the Amorites? Where are the Assyrians? Where are the Babylonians? You know, we don't see them around. Their national origin is lost. So why do we still see, maybe there's been intermingling and intermarriage, why do we see the Jewish people? Not so the Jewish people, right? Well, the Jewish culture has been remarkably coherent and enduring over time because the social structures that the Jews had in place for their national identity, it's incredibly important to the Jewish people. They place remarkable importance on passing on their traditions to their kids. And they have done this for all of those years, for all of those centuries. They know that if they didn't, there would soon be no Jewish people at all. And Jews believe that these social institutions are dictated and demanded by God of them. So that to abandon them is to risk one's own place in eternity. So it's hard. You know, and that's kind of hard for us today because we see people whose beliefs are very fluid, you know, and they change. And, but not so for the Jewish people who treasured those beliefs and had steadfastly maintained them over centuries. Now these notions were very strong in Jesus' day. But here comes Jesus. Okay? A rabbi from a lower class region. You know, what, what does the Bible say? Nazareth, what good has come from there? From a lower class region. Here comes Jesus who teaches for three years, who assembles followers who are mostly made up of lower class folks. And then he gets crucified and put to death on a cross, which the Jews considered to be accursed, just like thousands of other Jewish rabble rousers in the Roman period. And then boom. All of a sudden, after he's crucified, after a short period of time, he got over 10,000 Jews that are following him and claiming that he's been resurrected, inst instituting a new religion. And these Jews are willing to give up many of these key social structures that they have had in place that have tied them for years and years that had importance. They're willing to risk damnation to souls to hell if they are wrong. All of a sudden, they don't offer animal sacrifices anymore. All of a sudden, they don't worship on the Sabbath. All of a sudden, they're proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah when they've been taught the Messiah was going to free them from Roman rule. So why do they give all this up? Why do they make these changes? They give these changes up because something forced them to see the world in a different way. J.P. Moreland argues, how can you possibly explain why in a short period of time not just one Jew, but an entire community of 10,000 Jews were willing to give up these social practices that have served them for centuries? The explanation would have been that they saw Jesus raised from the dead. And then how do you account for the emergence of the church? You see this major cultural shift occurring. So you look to see what it was that caused it to happen. This Christian church begins shortly after Jesus' death and spreads so rapidly. Within 20 years it's in Rome. And then it takes over the entire Roman Empire. The birthplace of the church has been considered incredible and amazing that out of the death of someone branded as a criminal on the cross you see this remarkable thing happen. I like the way, and I'll, I've got to skip ahead and cut out some material because I know we've got a lot of, we haven't got much time left, but as one Cambridge New Testament scholar writes, he says, if the coming into existence of the Nazarenes, a phenomenon undeniably attested by the New Testament, rips a great hole in history, a hole the size and shape of the resurrection, what does the secular historian propose to stop it up with? There's other corroborating evidence, and we haven't got time to go into all of it because we've got just a short time for class. But you can talk about the conversion of skeptics, which has been tested in documents like Paul, like uh, James, uh, Jesus' brother, which is attested both then and outside of the Bible. The writings of Thallus, who you guys remember, I love that one, writes about trying to explain away the darkness at the time of the crucifixion as a solar eclipse. So what is the skeptic saying in response to that? Y'all, I think that it may just be the presumption here that it's just difficult for the skeptic to accept that something supernatural happened. 
that despite all this, the credibility of the Gospels, the eyewitnesses, the testimony, the history, the explosion of the church, there's the skeptic that just can't account for that supernatural thing happening. But you know, I go back to one of our very first lessons when we talked about the cosmological argument for God and the fact that science itself confirms that this universe came into place from something outside of it that was wholly transcendent, that wasn't here, that was timeless, and then reached into our universe and created everything that is or ever was. Now, if that's not a supernatural event, I don't know what else is. And if that was outside of time as a supernatural event, why then would you deny that another one could happen on a much smaller scale? A resurrection? As historian uh, N.T. Wright, author of The Resurrection Son of God, put it, he said, hey, it's no good falling back on science. That's how to disprove the possibility of any resurrection. Any real scientist is going to tell you that science observes what normally happens. The Christian case is precisely that what happened to Jesus is not what normally happens. For my part, as a historian, I prefer the elegant, essentially simple solution rather than the one that fails to include all of the data. To say that the early Christians believed that Jesus had been bodily raised from the dead and to account for this belief in all of this by just taking into account the fact that maybe they were telling the truth. That they were telling the truth. So what we got in summary? All right. In summary... We've got a very good reason to believe that Jesus was crucified and died on the Roman cross. And three days later, his tomb was empty. And that his disciples who had seen him flogged and crucified shortly thereafter believed that he had risen from the dead. We see they proclaimed it in the very same city where he had been put to death. That he appeared to them in both individual and group settings. We see they were so convinced and so transformed by this that they were willing to and did suffer and die in horrible ways for that conviction that he had been resurrected. And we see that this early movement was quick to break with key social structures that had endured for centuries, right? And to flourish in the same very area where their opponents could question them on important points if they were wrong. What is the most likely evidence for all of this? It's that something remarkable happened. It's that Jesus was resurrected. And here's the key. Isn't it reasonable to think that all of that adds up to something amazing happening? Or at the very least, how can an objective person, how can a skeptic, not at least admit that your belief in mine, that this resurrection happened, is a very, very reasonable belief for you to hold? And that is because it is. All right, guys, that's our class on the resurrection. We'll have one more class. We'll tie everything all up together, okay? Y'all have a good Sunday. Happy Mother's Day.